And good evening, everyone. How you doing? All right, let's rearrange here. Reposition, rearrange. I hope everyone's doing well. We're waiting on Paul Jenkins. Uh, he has not shown up yet. Uh, so, uh, well, let's kill some time until he gets here. Uh, oh, let's check how, well, of course, Jim Westbrook is first. Why am I not shocked? Uh, Miss Karen B., how are you? Jerry, Jeremy Burton, Double E. Uh, that's is that new? Double E. Are you new here? Uh, so let's see. Lady Mist, Jerry, Darren. Uh, oh, I was only a minute late, Jerry. Just, geez, chill out. Uh, I actually had good reason, which I can't tell you about. Um, Yes, uh, Charles Williams, a happy VE Day, everyone. 75th anniversary, huh? 75 years. Wow. That is uh, that is wild, and that's why it's been a while. Um, I'm doing well. I am doing – hey, Adega, how are you doing, sir? Good to see you. Good to see you. I just, a matter of fact, I finally gave away that extra copy of your book that you gave me uh, to give away – to someone and I'm trying to think if it was Jim here who I sent it to. I just sent it out too. Uh, th thanks. I mean, uh, yeah, I've had it here. And I was like, oh, I was building a box for someone. It was either Jim or it was. I don't know. Anyway, someone got your book, so thank you so much for that. I hope whoever gets it enjoys it. Oh gosh, excuse me for yawning. Uh, but all all's good. Um, what's, oh, it's a, it's a quiet evening here. It's only, uh, uh, only 26 people so far. Uh, it's interesting to see where they're coming from, from on Facebook too, but, um, more and more will be, will be, you know, the, the stuff on Facebook is really interesting because Facebook is trying to get into the whole live streaming bit. Um, and so now they're monetizing and so on and so forth. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. I, I, I don't honestly know. Um, Donnie, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, God. It, and I have no alcohol. So I hope you guys are doing great. Uh, what is up for the weekend for you guys? Um, what, is, what is up? John Tesla received his patches package is patches you're very welcome john my it, it is absolutely my pleasure um oh let's make sure let's make sure everyone knows the two big things right oh. sign up for the extra newsletter and go to the store um so yeah I, I filled a bunch of orders today a bunch of people had ordered the data list patch and a lot of people um boy i took a nap today by the way there's an, an app called nap 26 because 26 minutes is like the ideal time for you to uh, take a nap it's the ideal duration of a nap right you want you want you want it and there's all signs behind it like okay you want to do it before you get into REM sleep or whatever so that was this new application nap 26 so I got it and I uh, um, oh that's interesting uh, SAAB 2063 group. I, I'm not familiar with that group. I'll have to check it out. Um, so, uh, where, where was I? What was I talking about? <laughs> um, remind me what I was just saying. I was saying before Dale interrupted me with his wild cards thing. Oh, uh, uh, Patches. So yeah, so the patches, um, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, I think wait for, they don't want to buy a patch every single time we come out with a patch. So they wait and then they order a bunch. Um, but it was, oh, and I took my nap and the nap and the app was a great nap. It's called nap NAP 26. And, um, it's really interesting. Here it is. Uh, nap 26 right there, right on your phone and uh what and, and uh, you hit the button and it basically 
plays sounds as I guess sounds of the ocean. And then at the end of 26 minutes, it's like time to wake up and it you hear birds chirping, and you know, it's supposed it's supposed to be for the most conducive sleep. So I need to do it. I'm gonna do it, try and do it on a regular basis. I really think getting a nap every day is is really positive. Um So, damn, that's a lot of work, Donnie. Good for you, man. Good for you. Um, there you go, Charles. Went, yeah. Yeah. I get it. Ooh. The Dallas patch was uh, created by Mark Payton, did the all the initial work. Tim Davies did the, uh, the additional work on it. Uh Let's see. Uh, let's see. If, uh, and I'm waiting to. I texted uh, Paul. Uh, he, so I guess there's something new on Facebook. The way the messages show up. <laughs> yeah, this is a funny thing. Uh, uh, I got. I got to save this one, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let me uh, show this to you guys because I think it's pretty. It's pretty, pretty freaking funny. Um, as we, uh, Alyssa's painting in the background. I, you guys can't see her. I can see her because she's a. Uh, uh, she's in the ship, but she's painting, and she's got a uh, paint on her face, and she's in her pajamas or whatever, and uh, so. Uh, we're, we're, uh, let me, uh, this is hysterical. Read that. This is great. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, I, uh, I am suitably amused by that one. Um, oh, Ed Williams thinks, uh, okay, that's interesting. Interesting. Um, what's so? What else is new in the world of Star Trek for you guys, huh? Like, what do you guys do for Star Trek when between Star Trek between Picard and the next season? I guess what are we waiting for next? Discovery season three. Um, I don't. When is Discovery season three coming out? Nothing new on Trek movies. Uh, Discovery season three is. I don't think it's this year, right? I think it's next year. Someone, someone enlighten me. Um, yes, we're going to close that. Um, well, uh, hey, the USS Air, Drew, uh, the U Andrew, the USS Mary Aries model is uh, in the Aries Studio store. So go get it. Just as a matter of fact, I'm ordering more as, as we speak. I've got to fill some back orders and, and stuff and such. So, yeah, you want an Aries model? There you go. Go buy one. They're in the store and they're awesome. Um, ooh. Uh, okay, here we have, a, well, unfortunately, that's not a clickable link for me, uh, I guess. I can't even copy and paste it, so uh, I don't know. Pull, pull it up, uh, why don't you? Uh, Alyssa, can you, can you pull it up and put it in the... And, and put it in the share. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I, was, I was talking about that, talking about my, oh, there we go. If it's in post production and it's what is it May now, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when they release it. Uh, December, you know, maybe, maybe earlier. Could they get it done earlier? Hmm. Season three airs later this year. That was before COVID nineteen. Now, listen, if you're in post production, it it sh post production shouldn't be slowed down because of COVID. I could be wrong. I, I'm just guessing. I mean, I guess if you're doing a Composition with an orchestra, right? Um, Double E says he just watched the season four of, of Enterprise, uh, which is awesome, right? Season four is really good. 
Um, God, I don't know if I could go through Voyager again. Um, Donnie Pearson is yeah, a lot of, he's in, you're in Seattle. We got a lot of people in Washington, a lot. Jim, Jim Westbrook is down in Vancouver. Uh, we got Shane Freud is up in um, Everett. Um, yeah, so. Oh, there's Josh Irwin. Josh, how are you doing? Yeah, later this year, huh? Uh, uh, yeah, you're doing what a lot of people are doing. Um, so... Um, Vance, uh, Vance sent me a link to his new Menard fan film, which I'm in and Crystal's in. Um, and it's uh, it's 41 minutes. It's really long. I'm not used to really long <laughs> fan films. So uh, um, clearly he doesn't worry about too much about CBS. Um, God, you miss Oklahoma, really? Ooh, I guess you're missing the wide open spaces, huh? Um, so, uh, yeah, we went over So we went through Romulan War. I just, I messaged uh, Mark Nicarado from Romulan War and, and, and told him, hey, Sid, why don't you, why don't you come on? Um, love to chat with him, hear about, hear about the project, hear how it's doing. Um, uh, watched some of it the other night, uh, or the other day, the other morning. When did we watch it? It was yesterday, wasn't it? So I reached out to Mark and and, and touched base with him. So uh, that's all good. Um, let's see. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's see. Josh, are you around? Are you are you you wanna? While we're waiting for Paul, geez. See if we can get, there's some photos on your, that's interesting. I haven't seen those photos. Oh, those are TOS. Those are TOS. No, is that T? Yeah, where's this? Uh, so is this, I, I guess this is Avalon Universe. Uh, I'll just I'll just share this. Look at it, look at that. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, finer than fog here, my friend. How are you, brother? Oh, see, look, and just as you two guys pop in, Paul finally shows look up. Look at my, look at my. <laughs> what are you wearing? A, are you on a green screen? You've got a green screen filter going Yeah, a green on? screen shirt on. Look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're going to have to hand out, uh, 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 what, what are those uh, seasickness pills to, to, to right. people? I can well, turn it off. Like. While you do that, I'm just going to say, just check in. We're checking in real quick with Vance. Vance, how you doing? Oh, not too bad, man. Not too bad. What's going on, brother? Yeah. So I, I, I see you released. Is that really for public consumption, your film or? No, that... I'll be, I'll, I'll be releasing uh, a film tomorrow called uh, Between You and Me. Sorry. I have so many films that I'm like, oh, what is, what's going on? Of course on? you do. You and, can't uh, keep them all straight. <laughs> right. Right. And, and it's a, uh, it's a film that, uh, good old Josh uh, has edited. Um, so uh, yeah, and it's starring me and George Kyan. So um, yeah, it'll be out tomorrow. And then I'm thinking maybe next week or the week after we should have another one called Fantastic Daily. Um, and then after that, we will have the film Much Afraid. So if everything goes well, those will be the order of when they come out. So yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. When's the one that you sent me, the one with uh, Crystal and I in it? When's that coming out? That'll be 
that that'll be three weeks, not tomorrow or the next, but the week after that. So very cool, very cool. All right, well, you'll have to come on and talk about it. Well, we'll, we'll I'll have listen ho hook you up and f find a time when you're free and you can uh, uh, tell us about your latest projects. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, you guys be safe. All right. Thanks so much, my friend. You take care. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, and now we'll check in with Josh. Josh, you gotta explain something to me. What? You gotta, you gotta explain uh, th th this. Uh, let me share the screen so we can all see it here. Oh, right. Um, I can talk about that a little bit, actually. Um, that is an Avalon Universe film. That is the first thing that we filmed. Uh, this year we filmed it in January um, it's it's a really short you know two minute character piece it's called legacy those are some like basically behind the scenes production stills um, you know as you can see they're green screen you know kind of in the in the upper screens there that are going to be replaced but this is a, a film that incidentally takes place aboard an Ares class ship in the TOS era in the Avalon universe. So it's the, it's the USS Athena and it's a really neat little story about um, the two characters that are pictured there, the captain and, and the new helmsman helmswoman. Um, it's a, it's a really warm, sweet character piece that was written by Victoria Fox. Um, really great story. Um, it's 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 uh I, I don't know exactly when it's going to come out but um there it is um very cool very very cool we yeah some, we have some post work that we have to do on it but um very how long how long is this going to be it's about two minute piece so two, two minute all right very cool very cool well we'll look forward to seeing it then so, well, fa listen, and thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. Um, we'll, 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 it's always nice to know you're always there when, when, when we need a guest, <laughs> you're like the guest du jour. Yeah. Right. Ready made. So I'm going to get to Paul now, but, uh, and we will, uh, we'll, co we'll follow up with you. Maybe, uh, th maybe this weekend, if you have time, you join us because Jeff will be on in the mornings. So if you're around, I'll, I'll touch base with you. We can. Yeah. Give me a call and, and, you know, just tell me what you're thinking and we'll go from there. All right. Let's get out of your closet, man. <laughs> I never leave this place. Later, dude. Yep. All Ooh. right. Sorry about me being late. That is one of those things where I should apologize to everybody. If anyone was, was waiting on me and I know you were, um, it was one of those moments where I had that sudden panic attack. You know how it goes? Cause I'm, I'm so over, booked at the moment and um it was a, a very long day struggling to fix a project and when i was busy in the middle of it i thought oh well you know and i went biking i went i've actually my new quarantine porn is to go biking <laughs> so i did 16 miles today and uh in the rain and i was loving it and i got back and i thought well okay you know kind of look around and then i got hit with a couple of problems i started solving the problems and i had this thing in the back of my head like hang on a minute I should be doing something. Who didn't I call? And yeah, it, I've ooh. done that many times. <laughs> done that many uh, times. Apologies for all of that because it does uh, it does wind you up. You know, I know it's really frustrating sometimes when people don't show up. But I apologize about that, everybody. So here I am. Not a problem. Not a problem. How's the family doing? Uh, my family is doing well. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we're all doing great. I mean. First of all, in terms of me, um, this is pretty typical. This is my average Wednesday. Like quarantine is pretty much whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I know. I mean, we work at home as it is, so it's not like it. Yeah. Not like it's changed things. So I didn't mind that. Um, my boys are doing okay. They quite, you know, one of them's the teenager is a homebody. The little one turned nine the other day, which is crazy. He was two days ago, so he had a birthday, and we were worried. You know, like what's it going to be like? And he said, "Dad, that's the best birthday I've ever had." Um, oh, that's awesome. And one of his things is that he loves to play Fortnite. That's his big thing. Oh, God. And we got him and his brother and me and his mom. And she is literally the world's worst video game player. It's <laughs> shocking. I thought you were going to tell me she was like, uh, like surprisingly good and kicked all your butts. No, she's unbelievably bad. She gets really wound up. 
she gets hey right how you doing uh she gets uh really really wound up um and she <laughs> she starts getting like she doesn't know which way to turn and then she accidentally punches someone then she gets shot you know and she gets really upset and so we played a game um in which we play Fortnite, right so ultimately it was let's keep mum alive and it's trying to get her onto a helicopter as it like run forward. Well, I am running forward. No, no, just press the button. You're yelling at her and she's yelling back at you. The kids are screaming. The little one thinks it's really funny. We get her on, we protect her, we save her life. We won the game. So her one game, oh my god, was a victory royale champion. And I'm like, don't ever play again, babe. Like you're literally one and done. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> oh God, you are not batting above the Mendoza line. You are <laughs> She's doing great, right? So we kept her alive. She won the game. We, I told her, like, don't ever play again. You, you're, you're now you finished with Fortnite. Um, so we've been doing that. Um, and I have never been as busy right now as, as I am right now in, in, in probably in my career, even though at a certain point I was writing like five books a month for Marvel or whatever. I am so inundated with work right now, which is crazy, right? It's 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 slightly I'm slightly self conscious about it because I really understand how hard people are are, are working and, and and what the struggle is for so many people you know um, uh, with their jobs and everything and I'm very self conscious about the fact that that we I have a job and that that I'm in demand right now um, but also there's other projects for my company that we're doing uh, we're putting stuff together we're working on this that and the other um we are doing all kinds of things so crazy and i got a couple of kickstarters coming up so that'll be that'll be nuts i'm bringing fairy quest back which is that beautiful book that you've seen so uh-huh i Very think cool. I'm not sure about this. i think i, think I can share that one. yeah i can share a screen or something so people can even see it right sure. i can share a screen um, i'll show you you have to Here send a, send a link to listen she'll put it up i don't know if you can can you from oh, your, i can yeah you know, I, I, i'm okay. sorry yeah, we'll find out in a second. I'll put a, a piece of. I'll put. A I, I don't know what your else. screen looks like. I only know what my screen looks like. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I. I think I'm able to share a screen. But anyway, I'll find. A, I'll find an image so you can kind of see what the the artwork looks like. And um, you know, it's just with with that book coming back and uh, with all of the stuff that we're working on. Um, it's a it's a crazy time right now. It is. It is all hands to the pump, you know. So what? Uh, uh, so okay, you say you're busy, busy doing what exactly? So tell tell everyone what you're working on. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm working on a game project out of Korea. Um, I am working on. Um, uh, I'm working on uh, a screenplay for somebody for a film project. Um, that we are building into a larger project. Um, I just got a pretty decent offer. We, we'll see how this goes, but I got a pretty decent offer to direct another project um, uh, and to help with the game. Um, so ultimately, you know, here, let's try, by the way, let's try this share, you ready? Uh, does yeah. this work or not? Oh, there, there we go. go, there we go. Yeah, so this, this is the artwork uh, that people can see for uh, for Fairy Quest. Um, I can even do it in, slightly better detail but you know this is the book that we're bringing back so as you can see it's pretty beautiful so um, now is this the original artist you worked with um yeah this is this this one that i'm showing you is um we are going to uh work with a different artist guy called called mike um who is amazing uh, he's going to come in and do but he's very much the same style so we got that project coming up. Um, as you know, like we shot Warped over at your studio, which is fun. So I've I've edited already one of those, and we're putting together a few more. Um, we've got some good visual effects in for that project. Um, so we're we're building all of that. Um, man, you know it's it's uh, and and more. You know, I mean, obviously we're working on a couple of funding events. Um, we are building out a a show, a TV show project that we've got. Um, so it's it's hard to. And, and, you know, at some point when COVID lets us go, uh, we hope to be bringing back, you know, getting back to Axelor and finishing it out. So we're, we're certainly lined up for a ton of stuff, you know. Good, good. All right. Well, you need to tell everyone about Warp because not everyone knows what it is. Most people don't yeah, know um, what it is, I would, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, warped. So I can tell you the genesis of it, right? The genesis of it was when we were sh shooting Axelor around about um, October, this is the first shoot that we did, the big shoot over in 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 um, the studio. 
we were, you know, we'd had a pretty successful shoot. We were very tired. I think the last day everybody was a bit punchy, right? Um, but we uh, managed to find a way to finish a little early, which is always nice. And so at that point, I said to our producer, Scott Conley, right? I said, uh, hey, throw me a shirt. And we, <laughs> and we did a character. Um, I chucked it. I just threw a shirt on. And I said, do a fake interview with me. So we have like a funny B-roll kind of thing, you know, because we had all these interviews that were very serious. And and if you remember, Alec, you know, we had some pretty emotional interviews as well. There was some, you know, there was a lot of it was about wartime and we had a lot of one on one. So I thought, well, let's just kind of have fun. And um, so we did an interview with with me as a character who was like literally the worst employee of Starfleet. And um, he was sort of like the janitor. Right. And. And he was just terrible, you know. We kind of had fun. It was, and what we realized was this was really funny. So around about January, when you were gearing up to do the one day that we did with you, which I thought was really successful, that you know we should talk about that a little bit. The day with you as Garth, I thought was was really a good day. And so we worked with you, and we thought, well, you know, we're going to be over the studio. We should take advantage. The studio is great, you know. Like you were kind enough to let us take advantage of the studio and so we we did and we did a, a series of skits and it's basically about the worst ship in starfleet right? <laughs> um and it's run by a guy who used to be the janitor and he's terrible and they've got um you know they're just on the edge of the universe and at this point they're so far away and they've been out in space for so long that no one cares <laughs> like they've given up on the prime directive instead of not interfering they're just basically walking around interfering wherever they feel like it and having sex with anyone they find right and um they're bored on the ship you know and so we did this little skit and it's it's come out great um in fact uh, another thing i can do is i can bring up something to show you because we got uh some pretty tremendous uh we actually made our own ship and uh our ship is called the uss croydon um, so I know that doesn't fit into canon. It's we're not canon, right? But uh, the USS Croydon is so called because the captain is a big Crystal Palace fan, like the Premier League, and so uh, his ship is the USS Croydon. <laughs> Which is what? What is what does that have to do with Crystal Croydon Palace? Is, Croydon is a, is a is a section of of South London where Crystal Palace Football Club plays. Therefore, oh, you know, okay. they're right next gotcha. To gotcha. So okay. his would be the. Uh, his would be the thing. Uh, I see in the, the notes while they sorry for everybody. If my video is pixelating, it looks perfectly fine on my end and I have a pretty stable connection. So I'm not quite sure why people think I'm pixelating. Um, my, at the moment, my feed looks pretty good. So yeah, uh, let me know if we need to sign off and on again. Yeah. I'm not sure why that would be the case. Uh, uh, yeah. Hold on one sec. Let's just, uh, it's not, yeah, now you're fine, but it, we'll, all right, we'll, we'll go for it. Let's see how this yeah, works. We'll, we'll go for it. But anyway, so we have, yeah, we have a bunch of stuff. And, and in fact, uh, let me, let me, so sh let's see if I can just show it. Yeah, we got like the, maybe I can just bring up a, 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 uh, a still pick, right? Which we'll, we'll do that. I'll, I'll basically bring it up on camera and uh, it will be a still. But in fact, uh, I think you'll like the fact that, uh, in our case, uh, nobody's ever seen it before, so um, I can I can bring it up on the on the camera and uh, share it with you, and we will we will take a look at the USS Croydon. Um, one thing that's great about it is uh, it is absolutely uh, a tiny little ship. There you go. There's the Croydon flying through space. Uh, the rest of it, obviously, I've got to tease, but you know, just so that we're clear, it moves. <laughs> Whoop, there it was all right <laughs> so cool. got, yeah we're working on warped and and that's another thing um for us so as you can see we're really really busy and um you know this is just one of those things man it's like i feel so terrible because it's such a strange time in history uh, that we're dealing with but um you know it's 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 something that we're gearing to come out the other side of basically yeah. Uh, Starfleet says, uh, I was browsing your store and saw the beautiful USS Ares 1000th one scale model. Perfect starter for me and my Starfleet Academy cadet training daughter to build together. Absolutely. It's a really simple re resin model. 
So uh, yeah, that's a great one to, to, to build with your daughter, especially in these times when we're trying to find things to keep us busy while we're staying in. So, but anyway, I'm sorry. How did sorry, you get oh, that made, how did you get that made Alec? How did you get the, the model uh, made? There, there's a guy Wait, who made them for us a few years ago. And so, uh, yeah. And so we just got someone to, to make them again. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically, it's, it basically, you take the 3d model from Tobias and then he, it, does what's called making it watertight, meaning making it so you can actually print it out of a 3D printer. I got and, you right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the way, yeah, you're pixeling again. How about, I'll tell you what, if you can, we're going to disconnect you from the stream and have you reconnect to the stream, just using the same yeah, link. Yeah. yeah. So, and then maybe that'll make it better. We'll, we'll see how, if Paul's video improves there. Um, Oh, Roy of Siegfried and Roy passed away from complications from coronavirus. Uh, oh, that's a shame. Let me correct this. Someone's trying to reach the Airy Studios store and use the wrong URL. Uh, he used AriesStudiosStore.net. Um, so I just sent him a private message. So he's not, and we'll see when Paul comes back if he's okay. So, uh, yeah. So but a few people have been talking about the model. To, that's the third time someone's mentioned the model to me. Troy Light mentioned the model to me. Uh, he's like, oh, I was going to buy one, but I got five other models, models I got to build. And I said, well, you sound like just like the typical modeler, right? You know, modelers, we always have a box full of models we haven't made. Um, yeah, they were. Um, well, this is one we're working on, you know, and this might be a, you know, we might have to take an interest list uh, on, on this um, because I really want to get, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be an expensive kit, but I really would like to do it. So um, we'll see. We'll, we'll we'll see. I, I'd love to I, I, one three fiftieth. I mean that that would be in scale with my uh, master replicas enterprise. So that would be really exciting, right? Um, so we'll see. Um, yeah, it could well. Paul's problem really could be a broadband issue because of the rain. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm just reading your comments. All right, there, there he is again. Lissa will pop him in. All right, Sorry I don't think that. it's any better. I think it might be. Is it raining over by you? Yeah. Do you have? Yeah. What kind of uh, what kind of internet you have? Well, right now I've got 130 megs down even in the office I'm in, so we should be perfectly fine. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. What's your uh, what's what's your upload? Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, I mean we're. We're in good you know shape. what? It, and because right. my my video is not, uh, I and it, and it, it's it could just be the connection between you and the servers. You know, the with all the you know, it's Friday night. I bet there's a lot of people streaming, and that may just be the the issue. It's amazing how COVID nineteen is. My, it's just crazy the things that you don't really think of that uh, have been impacted by it. Um, yeah. Like, uh, so it, 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 and this is one of them, it's streaming and it, you know, sometimes it, it's tough, but anyway, um, so when, uh, when do we see the first warped episode? Um, we got it right now, you know, we have it available. Um, we want to get a couple more of them, but I would say probably in the next, um, in the next couple of weeks i think we'll do one of warped and uh we'll you know we want to have like three or four of them in the can in the can uh it's funny man i i got the first episode done and it, it was really funny it came out great uh and as you know we have a special guest in it <laughs> yeah um, all so right I'm working, on, uh, I'm working on that we got a very special guest in one of the episodes or two yeah, of the episodes Rick. actually a brick. That's right. Well, what happened was there's a story behind the drip. The brick is that we 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 do have an alien on board, but we actually have two, right? So one of them is this 
alien we made up called Grocknar, and he's we don't know what species he is. We just made it up, you know, um, whatever prosthetics we could do. He so, was good too. I like um, that guy who the actor. Yeah, he was great. He was great. The actor Michael was really brilliant, and um, we figured. Well, we need. We actually had a great joke for this, which was we had another one, which is a shape changer. And it had been, he'd been injured at Axanar and now he was in the form of a brick. So his name was Lieutenant Commander Brick. And he was just a brick that sat on a seat, basically. And um, the, 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 the joke was generally that the brick kind of sits there and everybody's like, what's that brick doing? And they're like, no, no, that's a shape changer. He's just been, <laughs> but it was just because we couldn't afford two alien prosthetics. So we figured we'd just make a brick as a character. <laughs> Well, it worked. <laughs> oh, so well, he's a great character. Everybody loves him. Yeah, God. So well, good. So, and what's that? Now, tell us a bit, little bit about Meta Studios. Everyone should check out Meta Studios. And matter of fact, uh, it is go check out Meta Studios. I'm going to just check, bring it up myself here on uh, on YouTube. You can go check it out. Uh, they need subscribers. Going out the door. What's that? Yep, uh, we've been working. We, we've been working lately with. Uh, so one of my best friends is Kevin Eastman, who's one of the creators of the Ninja Turtles. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, Kevin and I have been uh, doing some streaming lately about the the original days, and because I was the second, third employee over there, and so we've been streaming about the, what it was really like. Uh, we just had the thirtieth anniversary of the first movie. Um, wow! So we've really? been streaming. Yeah, crazy stuff, right? Um, I was streaming the other day talking about how I was on set with Vanilla Ice when we were making the second one. Um, it is it is nuts. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, we can even publish our link. I suppose I can send you the link to our our channel, and then uh, Lisa can probably... Uh, I think we have it on our homepage. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we... We've been working hard, um, just building up the channel, and and really, ours is a little bit different to some extent. Um, we're a little bit about um, we've been we've been doing a lot of stuff with fans lately. Uh, we've been just kind of kind of giving back to the fan community that pays my wages. Um, and you know, between myself and Kevin Eastman, I mean, you're talking about a bunch of guys that have had some pretty incredible experiences. You know, I've done so much work with Marvel. Um, I've done a bunch of game work. You know, I've done a bunch of and animation work. Um, Kevin created the Ninja Turtles. You know, I mean, he's a, the publisher of Heavy Metal magazine. We owned a oh, publishing is it really? company. We I didn't know a, that. A, 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 yeah, yeah. He bought Heavy Metal, Heavy Metal years ago. And oh, so wow. Okay. All of these stories. Uh, so we've done three of them. The first one was the 30th anniversary of the movie. Second one was all about the toys and the cartoons. Third one was about comics because we're so connected to comics, even though I'm not a big comic guy. And then the next ones are going to be crazy because the, the first of them is going to be all of the crazy stories that you've never heard before. Like no one knows this crazy stuff behind the scenes. And man, I'm telling you, there is some crazy back there. Uh, and then the ones after that, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about the darker side of this business and how difficult it can be sometimes. Um, and then we'll go into an expose of, of Tundra Publishing, which, you know, was a, a really big moment in, in American comic book history. Um, so between the two of us, we can probably talk for hours upon hours of things that no one's ever heard before um, about Ninja Turtles, about this, about that, um, and just about our respective careers. You know, um, Sometimes it amazes me. I look back on my own career and realize, oh, yeah, I wrote, you know, I got nominated for two BAFTA awards, the like British Academy Awards. I've had two nominations. I've been number one on the best New York Times bestseller list, and I never even think about it. Wow. Very <laughs> cool. I know it's crazy, and so why not talk about it a little bit? You know, um, so that's our thing at the moment. Oh, very cool. So, how many Ninja Turtle movies have there been? You know, I was around when we did the first three, right? There then, were three, okay. Then there was a reboot. Uh, there was an animated one, and then the Michael Bay films. And the Michael Bay films are sort of like basically, if you talk to Kevin and say, "What should we not do?" Oh no, <laughs> that's what you know. Like Kevin, Kevin told me, he told me the story. He said the guy behind it who came in as the director, first thing that the guy said was, "I don't know anything about Ninja Turtles. What do I need to know?" And Kevin sort of thought, oh. "Man, you're not, you're not even trying." So, for example, Kevin said, "Listen, man, you you will alienate everybody, everyone, if you if you give them noses." So they gave him noses. 
you know, it was almost like they tried to find a way to do anything that they shouldn't do. And uh, that's a bit of a shame, right? Uh, Gosh. Yeah. I know. Oh, geez. So Probably. what was Michael Bay producing it? Michael Bay produced it and they had different people directing it and stuff like that. And, and it was just, you know. It was, is it out of Kevin Eastman's control now? Is Ninja Turtles out of his Yeah, control? it's with Nickelodeon, uh, you know, so Viacom basically. And that's fine. Uh, you know, Kevin's long past it, right? I mean, at some point you get past the stuff that you create, you know. It'd be like asking me, you know, what do I think about the origin of Wolverine? It's like, well, I did it 20 years ago. That's what I think about it. You know, I could care less, right? So it's really just a matter of... Um, you know, what we're doing is we're talking about something that's really big in popular culture. I mean, Ninja Turtles is the single biggest licensing phenomenon of all time at one point, you know? Right. Um, so we're doing Ninja Turtles, but, uh, you know, my work at Marvel, I mean, I've done so much work at Marvel and they use so much of my stuff for their films. And so there's all of that. Um, but I do like concentrating on the things that are now, you know, I like, I like the things that are going on now, you know, the work that we're doing, um, all of those things are much more interesting to me sometimes than just going with past successes because you're just breathing in the fumes of something you've already done. I want to do what's next, you know? Right. I care about my work. I don't really care about what I've already done. Well, I, I care, but I just, I'm not obsessing on it, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, uh, someone says, best thing I know about the Ninja Turtles sticking out with me the most is that they're big pizza lovers. <laughs> they are big pizza lovers, yeah. Um, there was always this thing, Kevin and I, uh, we were sort of laughing, you know, because we get asked all the time, like, what's your favorite Ninja Turtle, right? You know, there are four of them. And um, I would always pick the downtrodden one. So for me, it was Donatello because no one cares about Donatello. But there are some really funny stories in there, Alec. There's actually a couple of stories that I think, are, you know, there's, there's one... Um, uh, we were talking about the licensing the other day and think about what happens, you know, when you own a product, right? So we have the Ninja Turtles and they got bandanas and they got weapons, right? And kids love them. And I learned an amazing lesson years ago. Uh, a guy who was a licensee told me, listen, I pay you guys 30 cents for a, for a Frisbee. Every Frisbee I sell, I give you 30 cents of a licensing fee. But let me tell you how it works. If I sell that Frisbee, it, normally I sell it for a dollar. If I put Ninja Turtles on it, I sell it for seven. And kids, wow. buy, kids will buy 50 of those for every one plain one that, that I'll sell. They want the Ninja Turtles badly. So the commerce of it, you know, you think like, all the money that was coming into us, man, the commerce of it is it's not even close. You know, like the, the money was being made by other people especially. And so the stories behind it are really interesting. You know, we at a certain point would go to, we, we went to Hong Kong one time and the Chinese licensing agent said, yeah, yeah, it's not very popular over here. And so we got off the plane in, in, um, uh, in Hong Kong and the whole place was green. I mean, it was everywhere. They told us it wasn't popular. It was literally climbing through the walls of the, of the, of the airport. But that's because they were basically trying to rip us off. Well, of course they were. Yeah, they're Chinese. The, the Chinese uh, in intellectual property, that's just, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, this is, that's a tough one to say because obviously I don't think there's any sweeping. There's no sweeping thing in terms of a – but but culturally, I would say. No, yeah. no, no. It's it's more yeah. the business climate over there. The, the business government. climate over there, it's like why pay for it when you can rip it off, right? Exactly. Like, well, yeah. pay for it because that's how international trademark and copyright works. Right, so exactly. Let me let me tell you a fun story, right, to give people an understanding of, of what we were dealing with. We had a guy – uh, and his name in the Middle Eastern ter territories was Abu Shadi, like S H A D I. So we called him Abu Shadi. And this is what the guy did. When the Ninja Turtles came into those territories uh, to be sold, he sent us a cease and desist letter and said, No, you can't use my creation, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we said, Yeah, good luck with that, pal. Like international copyright and trademark law doesn't work like that. And he And he would only ever say, my creation, the Teenage Mutant. So, well, I'm sorry if you feel that way about my creation, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he would go on about it. So we were sort of like, whatever, you know, like this guy's not going to have any luck. And then we realized what the problem was. He was going to put an injunction because he knew all the people in the territory. So we were going to be delayed putting our product out while we fought this injunction in court. 
And with those particular territories, it takes a really long time to get in there. So once you get in, it only lasts about 18 months at most. And wow. so he was going to destroy any potential we had for earnings because the next thing would come along. So he was basically demanding money by menaces. And he said, you know, basically, in a sense, if we were going to make $12 million, he wanted four of it. And if, he, if we didn't give him four for his creation, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he would slap an injunction on us and we would never make a penny. So it was a question of do you want to make eight or do you want to make nothing? And what about the principle of it? And so, you know, we had a frivolous lawsuit thing that we would do all the time. Everybody would sue us. They would always say they created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and we would have to. We had that stuff all the time. And half the time or, or very often, it was better to settle out of court and just give them a bit of money to go away than it was to, to mess with it. Wow. Which is really depressing, but it's just the way that it works, you know? Yeah, I know. <sighs> What, what are you going to do? I know uh, Lou Ferrigno is a big person who loves suing people. He uh, he had literally, Lou Ferrigno has sued his brother twice yeah. for using the name Ferrigno. Yeah. Um, he might be one of the worst human beings that I've ever I, I do not like him at all. Sorry. Yeah, no. Uh, my, good, my good friend, uh, Dennis Illich, uh, had, uh, he had, had uh, he, he, what was it? It was, he got, Oh, he was doing a book with Lou uh, called The Men of Sci-Fi. And he photographs all these guys and, and, and puts them in his book. And he had releases and everything. Like, And anyway, it was just this – he told me the whole story. So basically when we were being sued by CBS, he got this letter from Lou Ferrigno's lawyer saying, you know, we're suing you, blah, 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 or you can give us $50,000 to go away. And Dennis was, he's from Australia. So he was all freaked out because he doesn't have $50,000. And that. I was like, hold on, dude. Let's talk to, uh, I said, let's talk to Aaron, my lawyer over at Winston Shawn that was handling our lawsuit. It was CBS. And, um, and fortunately, Aaron was nice and said, we'll take care of this. And so she and, and their firm responded to this lawyer and said, you know, which was basically like, we're Winston Strawn. You want to fuck with us? Yeah. Right. You know, and, and Lou Ferrigno went away. It was never an issue, an issue again, but it was like Lou Ferrigno was his friend. Lou Ferrigno was, he was taking photos with him. He was giving Lou Ferrigno free stuff. And the, and then Lou decides to, uh, anyway, I yeah, hear that I, he did it all the time. And he's my first encounter with Lou Ferrigno was at a convention. I didn't really know the guy. And, um, uh, I was introduced to him. Somebody said, why don't you take, I, I was starting to write the Hulk. And someone said, hey, why don't you go stand with Lou and take a photo? And someone in from the show brought me over there. So I said, yeah, because I knew his reputation. He's a horrible person. And I went, well, OK, fine. And so I went over to him and um, he he wanted he they, they lined me up so that I would hold his hand and we would shake and then we would smile. And I, I, I had heard about this. I knew that he would do this, but I didn't think he would do it to me. So I go to take the photograph with him. And uh, they take the photo for, and then he looks at me and he says, that's $20, right? And he squeezed my hand really hard. And I'm like, don't think so, pal. And so he squeezed a little harder and I'm like, seriously, even if you squeeze my hand that hard, I don't care. And he let it go. I'm like, you douche, you know, what an asshole. Like, I'm not afraid of you, pal. I don't care who you are, right? I don't care about you. And listen, you might have a very strong grip and congratulations. I don't care, man. I don't care about you. I don't care anything about you. So he's when I find people like that, Alec, that have a lack of a fundamental lack of kindness, I do not appreciate it. And I will always, always, always stand up to bullies. So, yeah, um, listen, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I just I, I can't tolerate when I hear that. I almost we were at the Palm after this whole thing happened. We were at the Palm Springs Comic Con yeah. and Lou was there. And it was only like two weeks earlier that this whole thing had gone down. So it was summer of 15, uh, summer 16. And uh, Crystal was there. Crystal had to hold me back because I was ready to go over to Lou and say, Lou, fuck you. Yeah, yeah. You mess with my friend. You're yeah. just disgusting. No, so, I, but I didn't. I didn't do yeah. that. I didn't want to. I didn't want to make a scene and Crystal would have been upset. So there's I didn't say anything. A thing that you'll like, Alec, there's a thing that's kind of fun is when I met him at that show, it was at Chicago Comic Con, actually. And um, he, he 
at the end of the day, I think he'd, as usual, alienated everybody. Everyone was really frustrated with him. He would often, if people, one of his MOs was to, to have, you know, anybody, even a teenage girl, someone like that, you know, would stop and say, oh, it's Lou Ferrigno. And he would stand out so people, he was accessible. And they would take a photo with him and then he'd say $20 to them. And he'd just bully them out of money, right? It's very <laughs> rude, right? Because no one thought, the context of it was that, you know, you were just getting a picture with a guy. You had no idea. And then you found out he's, he's really horrible. And at the end of the day, we were in a sports bar, um, a very famous sports bar there called Knuckles, right? <laughs> we used to call it Fisters. And, uh, <laughs> and we used to, we were drinking there and people would sit in the atrium and Lou Ferrigno walked in and he basically said, um, he looked at the room and he, you know, he doesn't hear probably, he's, he's got a hearing impairment. And he said very loudly, I want to sit down. And the comic fans who are, you know, normally timid just looked at him and then couldn't even bother with him. They just looked and he never got wow. a seat. He stood there at the door for a second and then he, he moved away with his handler. And I was like, well done, everybody. Like, you know, you, everyone got that guy's number. Now, let's let's do a positive, right? Uh, for as horrible as Lou Ferrigno is, Mr. T is the best. Is he? That's awesome. Mr. T is awesome. T is the best. You know, you know where T is at a convention because he is um, because there's laughter coming over him now and people and there's a big crowd around him and he's like, yeah, how's it going, everybody? And he's just so friendly and so kind to the fans. That is fantastic. I love that guy. I love that guy. Everyone should always like think positively of Mr. T because he is one of the good guys. I love that dude. That is really awesome to hear. That is that's great because I, I yeah I, I loved him in the A team. He was just so damn good. Pretty the fool. <laughs> he was so damn good. Yeah. Uh, so good. that's good. Yeah, it's always good when you hear. You know, I I, I noticed a couple of comments. A couple of people are disappointed to hear about Lou Ferrigno, and um, yeah, you always want to know that someone that you admire is a really cool person too. Um, I, I could do a list of really cool people, right? So that no one gets their illusion chat. And there's, there's not really that much point in listing all the people that aren't very nice because at that point it upsets people, right? But I will say that Lou Ferrigno is, is pretty out front about how unpleasant he is to everybody. You know, he is a bully. He's a terrible bully and he bullies people out of money. And that's, that's awful, right? Um, some of the cool people that I know, you know, I either know them or I've met them. I mean, I know loads of people I've seen this business across film, television. Um, T is one of the nicest people. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I feel bad about like even picking some of the good people out because there are plenty of really, really nice people. And, and also one thing to understand is that a lot of people are not trained, you know. So in the comic film, animation, video game world, we're not trained to be with fans. We just happen to get in front of fans all the time. Yeah. You know? Um, well, yeah. I, you know, it, 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 what you always want, it seems, is is you want someone with a purpose, you know, just an amazing personality. Who's mm -hmm. I listen? I love Stan Lee. I just think he was one of the, you know, and I, I can't imagine that in private he was any different than he was in public. I mean, he always. How, how was you? you have, did you have? You know, you must have dealt with him at some point since you were doing. Yeah, something I, was, I, mean, I will tell you that um, it can almost make me emotional, right? So. So I got a phone call when I was getting married to my wife. Um, he sent us congratulations and he was making fun of me because he said, she's, she's too good for you. <laughs> and he was right. As usual. Of course he was right. Um, but um, I will tell you that one of my best days in my career, I'm, I'm not really a fan fan myself, right? I'm not, I don't have much of a fan mentality. Um, I'm too busy working to have it. And so there are very few people that I will say that I am a fan of, right? I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm, I just don't really have a lot of fandom in me, you know? Um, I probably do for, like, my football team, Crystal Palace. That's yeah. right? They'll show up everywhere. And they are in my work for 30 years. They've been in my work. They're in comic books. Um, I've got Crystal Palace everywhere. In Judge Dredd, I named one of the big city blocks after our center forward, Wilf Zaha. <laughs> I have... I've named a street, a bridge in Gotham was called Selhurst Bridge after Selhurst Park, which is where we play. I've put Crystal Palace everywhere, right? Beyond that, um, you know, the kind of people I want to meet, Neil Armstrong, Muhammad Ali, Dalai Lama, those are impressive people to me. Um, if you put me in front of Oprah or 
someone i'd go hey nice to meet you how you doing i could care less i just that's not for me yeah. um we did lose someone yesterday uh, that, that i think i care about very much it's, so it's all personal right um uh so florian schneider who was the, one of the two people that formed the band craft work uh died yesterday oh yeah i saw that yeah right? and I, I loved craft work. that's why i wanted to be a musician like you see this i've got you know because i have a studio here like i've got this to do the music some of the music i do because of florian schneider because of him uh, ralph and florian from Craftwork and john michel jean those are people that i really cared about so it's all relative right but um here's my fan story with stanley uh it is kind of cool i'm not a fan guy but one day i got a phone call from the editor-in-chief um and we had been doing a book called the century i created a character called the century for marvel right and the idea behind the marketing campaign was that it was a lost creation of stands that I had found in a cupboard. Right, right, right. Um, I remember. Did they did it, right? And Stan had read it. He'd read the book. And he called up my editor-in-chief and said, I want you to give that boy a message. Tell him he's a genius. Oh, that's awesome. And that's cool, right? Because Stan Lee thought I was a genius. That That's pretty cool. He's really high on what I'd done. And he liked my work. Um, so that's very nice to... That's very nice to hear from somebody like Stan, who's so iconic. However, you know, I will tell you that the true person who was the creative person, the 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 real juice behind Marvel is Jack Kirby, the king. Jack Kirby created almost everything. Stanley didn't create shit. Sorry. He didn't, he he created some of it. He did, right? So I don't want to be too dismissive of Stan. He really did. But Jack created everything. Right. And Stan was the company man like Walt Disney that sort of was at the company that co-created it with him. But it, it was Jack and it was Steve Ditko. And so for his entire career, Steve Ditko didn't want to talk to to Stan because Stan was basically I created Spider-Man with you. And right. Steve, no, you didn't. I created Spider-Man. So there's a lot of difficulty in that that situation with Stan. I, I think the legacy of Stan should be that, you know, look at what he contributed. I mean, so much. And so I, I don't think it would be fair to say that he didn't, but I do think it would be fair to say that the people who really did were very prominent in what they did. Right. So Jack Kirby should be elevated way up here as the person that created everything that Marvel are making money out of right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I certainly in talking to people in the industry, they, they, they've, um, I think the other thing is De Kirby died early, right? Yeah. What, uh, what, uh, Stan outlived Kirby by 25 years. Yeah. So there's all that time when Kirby and let's face it, Kirby was an unpresupposing person himself. I mean, he was not a self promoter the way Stan is. So, no, but that's, that's it, Alec, right? So he wasn't a self-promoter. And I, I'm very much not a self-promoting kind of guy. And um, what happened with Jack was that he went to go work for Ruby Spears, who were the people that um, made HR Puff and stuff, amongst other things. You know, they did oh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. And um, they gave him a job because they felt badly for him. You know, Marvel took all of his artwork and gave it away or, or trashed it. And it was his. It belonged to Jack, right? There is no assumed work for hire. So at a certain point, Jack and Roz, his wife, finally got a, uh, an attorney. Now, Jack would go to work at Ruby Spears. Rod would he'd brown bag his lunch. Roz would go see him at lunch. They'd sit there. They'd eat. He'd draw a bunch of crazy stuff. And then he would go home. So there's all this crazy Kirby stuff that people had never seen before. And um, then, unfortunately, um, yeah, it's, yes, like Bill Finger, right? So Bill Finger really was behind Batman. And Bob Kane is the person that they wrote Batman. Said, you know, did it. But Bill Finger did it. And so... Here's Jack, you know, and, and so eventually he took Marvel to court, and you know, and he and and, and they fought against it constantly. And then he died, and then Roz it outlived Roz as well. She died, and then the children. And the morning of the Supreme Court uh, decision, they settled out of court with the with the heirs of Jack Kirby, but they put them through 25, 30 years of crap before they they. Now was 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 that. And when was that? Was that all Ike, or was that well, while well, Stan was in charge of Marvel? Uh, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't Stan. I mean, Stan had gone at that point. But you know, it was it was very important to to everyone to understand that, like, it was true that Jack had done it, and they had no assumed work for us. So those were Jack's characters, right? Sure. Jack never benefited from it, and he didn't even get his yeah. artwork back. And so yeah. this is the plight of the creator, and it's what had me run screaming away from Marvel and DC years ago. I'm not. I don't care. 
you know. Like, and isn't that why you know Jim Lee and those guys broke off and did their own thing because they were sick of that whole studio system? Yep, and and so those of us who want to get away, I mean, I, years ago, I really didn't want to do it. You know, I'm not that guy. I, I, I was very instrumental in helping them rebuild their content. Um, you know, you're welcome, Marvel. <laughs> uh, but in the end. I, I don't care, man. Like I'm, I'm more about like making my own stuff, which is why I do what I do now. You know, I don't really mind. I've already done that. And now it's time to go do all the other things that I want to do anyway, which I do, man. I've got, you know, I've got a big digital product project um, uh, in Canada right now. We've got Warped coming out. We've got uh, some film projects. I'm writing a screenplay for somebody and we're developing out a TV show. You know, I've got all these things. And they're mine, man. They belong to me. They don't belong to Marvel or Sony or Warner Brothers or all these other corporations I've made a lot of money for, they, they're, they're ours and we can make them, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, it's always better to own your own IP, right? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. what, that's what we're working for, you know? Yeah. And then you can do, then you can do what you want and you don't have to deal with anyone else's bullshit. You know, it's just, it's, uh, listen, it's so much, it's, and that's kind of like Hollywood these days. It's, you know, uh, there was this, I forgot who it was, but a few months ago, the, the, you know, this famous writer from Hollywood came, was on Twitter and, and he said, basically, people keep asking me how they sell a script in Hollywood. And my answer to them is, you don't. The chances that you're going to sell a script in Hollywood are infinitesimally small. You have a better sh chance of starting in the NBA. He said, yeah. what you need to do is you need to make films. He says, that's what you need to do. So yeah. learn to make films. So take your camera and go out and make a two-minute film and edit it and show it to your friends because they're probably the only ones who are going to want to see it. And then go back and make a five-minute film yeah. and, and then make a 10-minute film. And he says, and keep making films. And he says, eventually you're going to get it and someone's going to notice you if you're any good. So Yeah, yeah I agree. And, uh, you know, like make it happen yourself. I'm lucky because I've obviously had an opportunity to make things happen for myself because of work that I've done at um, – at Marvel and DC, at Warner Brothers, you know, I've obviously got a background where I've done a lot of stuff that's made a lot of money for a lot of people. And at that point, there's a lot of attention that's paid to me. And at that point, then when I do a new project, I get, I get, you know, a lot of, a lot of positive and a lot of kudos, you know, so we, um, that's why I was showing, you know, like I said, I was showing you like Fairy Quest. I mean, Fairy Quest is so beautiful. I wanted to show you something else, by the way, I, I brought this up because I, I was searching um, I wanted to tell you a funny story while we we're on because it's kind of the, the stuff that we're doing in our background, right? So I want to show you this thing. So we were talking a little while ago about, about me working with Ninja Turtles. And at the time, you know, I was working in merchandising and I was a kid. And so at one point I had, um, I got sent a piece of artwork and it's this piece of artwork. Um, I don't know if you can bring it up. We got it. Okay, so here you go. So this is the very famous uh, Ninja Turtles pinball machine. It was a really good one, right? But as you can see, April is, let's say she's kind of well endowed. <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> and so the way this came down was that I had the artwork in front of me. They had sent it to us, and we knew that April, uh, you know, she didn't, they had a very flat chested in the original one and we were just kind of giving art notes. So we were drawing on it and we were saying, well, look, you know, we think that splinter should be right here. And, um, you know, Hey, let's, let's make sure that the Ninja Turtles are looking a bit more dynamic. And one of the things was, you know, I had a note and I was like, yeah, you know, guys, you, you kind of need to make sure that April has a chest because she looks like a little boy. And so I drew a W on her chest as a reminder to them that is a note. Well, exactly where I drew the W is where they made her boobs. So they made them as big as my W, which was like, holy crap. Oh, God. That's hysterical. So I, I am responsible for turning April O'Neil's breasts into that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's crazy. Um, anyway, so... Uh, it's funny, you know, I've had such a varied career doing lots of different things. And so I have a very big insight into creators, uh, cr creators rights and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, having had so much exposure, it's, it's relatively easy to see 
you know, when people are good and where they're not and who's who's doing well and who's who's contributing and who's just there for a ride. You know, you'd be surprised that a lot of the very famous people, very well-known people are super cool. And then when they're one level down, they're not so quite a lot of those people are not so pleasant, right? Because they're so desperate to be the A-lister, but they're not, you know? Wow. Really? Yeah. I, found well, I, I think I, and Hollywood's Hollywood's Hollywood, you know, that's an interesting place. It is. It was the biggest small town in the world. You know, I just started working with a new pr producer that I haven't known very long. Uh, she's lovely. And, and as usual, we all know the same people. You know, it happens to me all the time. I know I'll run into someone and we all know the same people at the same studios. I uh, just got involved with a new animation project and the people behind the animation were talking to me about this buddy of mine. It was not really a buddy, someone that I knew. I knew um, so a guy called Mike Moon used to be the person that did um, uh, Powerpuff Girls. And he went to be the head of animation at Sony. And I knew him. I, I used to go see him all the time. And now he's the head of animation at Netflix. And they were working on a Netflix project. And I said, do you know Mike? And they were like, yeah, yeah. And so now we're all chatting about, it's so crazy how, this business, like everybody kind of knows everybody because it is a, a small town. Huh? It is so crazy how it works. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know. Hollywood's a very different thing. It, it's especially coming from, uh, coming from technology and, you know, starting a technology company is so much easier than getting a film made of your property. Yeah. I mean, it's just there's so much involved in in Hollywood, and there's so many people that you know that that are trying to do what you're doing. Right. I mean, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have sold scripts in LA and sold scripts, and and also lucky enough to have written content that's grossed a lot of money. Right. So now, as we do Meta Studios, you know, as we do what we're doing, um, it gives us that opportunity for people to look at us and say, well, what have you done? And the answer is, well, you know, I created this game and it grows $3 billion. How's that? You know, That's not so bad. Right. And so you can kind of look across the spectrum and I haven't done it once I've done it repeatedly. And so that allows people to kind of get a measure of whether or not we can be successful. Right. Um, but even in all of that, it's really hard, man. It's hard to raise money. It's hard to get stuff done. Um, the, the strangest part of this COVID situation, Alec, is that we are so busy and everybody's in development right now. And so investments into these things are more robust now than they have been in a long time. And part of the reason is when we get out of this, everybody's library will be exhausted. And so they're going to need a bunch of people to make a bunch of content. Right, 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 right. Well, and also this, there's, there's so much... I mean, you, you just flip through. You've got so many apps, so many streaming services. Everyone needs content. I mean, I don't I can't even keep track of all the streaming services. And I mean, AT, you know, there's a there's a channel. I don't know if you have AT and T at home, but AT and T has a, a channel called Audience, and uh, I get it. And I'm fascinated by it because they've got all these the interview shows on it. You know, there must be three or four different interview shows that I watch. Dan Patrick, uh, Tim Fenris, uh, Sam Jones. And I'm just like, wow, this is great. Now, And it's easy content for them to produce. But everyone's got, you know, Apple. You got Apple, Apple's got a channel and Dis the new Disney channel. And, I mean, forget, even if you put aside Disney, Hulu, Netflix, and and uh, oh my, uh, the, 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 and Amazon, there's so many other channels trying – to to get noticed and they all need unique content in order to be successful in order for them to convince you to pay them eight dollars a month or whatever their fee is that's right they need the content and frankly we've proliferated it in a way that look you know right now this next year the academy awards are now going to be open to films that have streamed and not gone out in theaters because of what's happened with covid right um covid this situation that we're all in, and I hope everybody is safe out there, and I hope everybody doesn't feel too scared of it and too worried. You know, I, I worry for everybody, right? But COVID is going to do some things that I think that we didn't think were possible. You know, some things are going to happen because of COVID, it seems. For example, teleworking, right? We hear about it, but, you know, it just looks like that seems to be a thing that we're now going to understand. We'll understand how to do teleworking. Um 
we may have under learned to understand that science doesn't care about your opinion. So if you don't think global warming is a thing, that's great and all, but science doesn't give a rat's ass what you think. Science is only going to be what it is. So if you don't think that COVID is that bad, that's fine until you get it. Or, or you know, what I would probably say is, if, you know, your theory is, well, it's not that bad and I don't need to wear a mask. It's like, okay, well, I want you to hold the hand of some person that is trying to struggling to draw breath as they die and see that and see, you know, let's have some compassion. I think in the end, as much as there's difficulty and resistance, I think what will happen out of COVID is that we'll see perhaps a little bit more care for each other. I hope that the hyper partisanship between people will begin to go away as much as it seems like it's prevalent. People will think that they're in it together. Um, people will telework. The, the environment may get a chance to, to heal just a touch because we may not be using as much gasoline and, and other things for a long time. So, so there are as it's, it's like, it feels like Ragnarok, Alec, you know, where you destroy everything and then the roots grow from within the destroyed building. You know, it's a time of renewal and maybe that's what's happening. We, we're having to renew because we have dumbed up this planet then. And so hopefully, um, hopefully that's what comes of this. And so now I'm going to apply it to the entertainment industry. This could be a very big positive thing for the entertainment industry. The waste on movies is incredible, man. People waste so much money. That's true. The need for blockbusters events in theaters was passed 10 years ago, but we're still doing it. And now we don't have to do that anymore, right? You can still have events and blockbusters, but guess what? You're going to start seeing people really look at dramas and things that genuinely entertain them and start saying, let me broaden my horizons. Let me, let me do other things instead. So amazingly, the COVID thing, as, as hard as it is, and I do not want to be glib about it, it's awful for so many people. But um, I think it's going to have a positive effect. The last thing I'll say, and I see Jeff made it, from Reach Films made a, a comment here. The future of production is going to be indie-style production. Like when, in, in the independent, independent world, we don't waste money. Sometimes we do, but... We, we try to be concise. We try to have two people doing, you know, one person doing two things to help us. You know, we don't have like specialized jobs where someone sits around on set, does nothing all day, you know, but the big blockbusters will spend 350 million on crap, you know, 150 to 200 million of that is wasted, right? But that can't happen anymore. There's going to be compliance officers. There's going to be, how do we do it properly? There's going to be virtual production. There's going to be all kinds of things. So I think the, the future of production is going to be more of like an indie style production, which is great for you and I. Mm -hmm. It's wasting money. I suck at. You know. Why do you? Um, why do you think? So why do you think that's going to be? You, you 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 know. Why do you think that things are going to be more indie? That they're actually going to pay attention to the money spent because there's this whole infrastructure in Hollywood that gets paid to do what they do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, the reason I say it, Alec, is because, first of all, we're going to find out how many people are obsolete in this in this actual job. Because once we get back to production, it's going to have to be a certain kind of thing, right? We are going to have to be compliant with safety. We're going to have to do certain things that we weren't doing for a long time. You know, we're going to have to be very compliant. Once we get into those compliances, everything is going to be looked at, right? So, you know, how is it? How is how is makeup and hair, how's hair and makeup going to work on a set? They'll probably be offset and they'll be called in to do this, but then last looks and all the messing around and sitting around doing nothing, that's not going to happen, right? So we're going to be quicker. We're going to make stuff, um, do things a little bit quicker. We're going to do virtual production, uh, remote producing, sure. You know, I, I do I do voice directing quite often and I do animation work. And I, you know, I did one Ninja Tales a couple of years ago uh, for, for Nickelodeon. I didn't even go to Canada to, with the with the animator. I didn't go there. I didn't have to go there once because I was voice directing elsewhere. And every asset that I saw from story is a digital file that travels at the speed of light. So why do I need to go there? You know, I didn't need it. I didn't need to do anything there. And anything else was like you and I are talking right now. It's just a Zoom call. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I um. Well, I believe that. I believe things are going to change because we do need to be more 
virtual. Uh, yeah, I agree with all those things. The thing I'm not convinced of is that Hollywood will figure out a way to spend less money. No. Uh, uh, okay. So let me, yeah, let, let me not misspeak. They'll waste a bunch of money on crap. Fine. I'm saying that productions will be much more like indie style productions. There's going to be less people on set out of necessity. So if you've got less people sure. on set, you still need to get those jobs done. So those people are going to do two jobs or three jobs. You know? Yeah. Well, listen, we were talking, you know, Jeff and I were talking about, you know, how we're going to shoot these war stories, these little vignettes that we want to do. And we we're like, well, how many people do we really need on set? Like, really? Like, okay, the actor. Okay. And, and, and then we need the DP, the director, lighting, one guy to handle lighting and gaffing and all of that stuff. Okay. There you go. That's four. Like, mm -hmm. can we get it done with four people? Now, granted, we're a small indie production and, and you know, but that thinking of going from, oh, uh, we need eight people or 10 people down to, can we do it with four? You know, um, is the type of thinking you're talking about. Yeah, I'm, I think what we'll all look at is, yeah, can we do it with four, right? No. Okay, we can do it with six. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to do that because of the necessity of having less people on set. So all of a sudden, these pro these productions are going to be much more like indie productions. Now, that being said, man, yeah, sure, they'll they'll still put $300 million into a production, and you'll sit there and go, like, what? I remember, I remember when the third Spider-Man movie came out, and, and, you know, these first three Spider-Man movies I was very close to because they used my story for the first film with Tobey Maguire. And I literally had a phone call from the editor in chief. And he said, listen, they found a book that you wrote called, it was called the revenge of the goblin. And um, it was all about how the green goblin uh, to me, because I was very much a character writer. I wasn't really writing superhero books. Um, so his son in the stories is kind of a useless idiot and he's a drug addict. And, so Norman Osborn, the goblin, quite rightly says, I don't want that guy to be my heir. I want that guy, Spider-Man, to be my heir. Right. I want that guy. So we wrote a book that was really intense. And it was about how he tries to make him kill somebody. Um, and and when he, you know, he, he gets him this close. And so they, they loved that story and they used it as a big part of like the goblin wanting um, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, to be, to be Spider-Man, right? So I've been in that situation where stuff of mine has been used and I, I know, you know, that I know that how those movies got made. Obviously I wrote the origin of Wolverine, right? So I got a good friend of mine who helped make some of those original Wolverine things, but here's the problem with, um, here's the problem with, with that. They made the third one for $350 million dollars. But they were like Emperor's New Clothes, Alec. At a certain point, he took his mask off in the middle of a subway, and every fan of Spider-Man went, no way would he do that. So you wasted $350 million on a thing that everybody went, nope, no thanks. So why would you do that? Just write a good story and make a good film. Um, by the way, I would say that somebody put in a, a, uh, a comment here that I see that says it's going to take much more time with four electricians, which is true, right? We... I don't know that we know it's going to be four or six or one or whatever. What we're saying is it will probably have to be less people, right? It'll have to be less people than, than it was before because – so that's why it's going to, to, uh, to the more indie style, right? Less people are going to have to make it. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wish – we you know, and listen, we talk about this all the time, like, you know – Star, Star Trek Beyond was a $190 million film before marketing. And you, you, you're just like, you know, you, you may, they know how much they made $430 million on the previous one. Mm -hmm. So that sh they should have been able to back into a number to be profitable. And that number was not $190 million. Uh, you know, that but if, if you have to, if you're only making $430, that means your entire budget, including marketing, has to be 215, right? Yeah, here, here's the thing. Double. So I had 215, including marketing, but they, you know, they spent 290. Here's the thing, Alec. I happen to know, because I've been in this business a long time, I know loads and loads of people. 
Uh, I know, for example, one film, and I won't be that specific about it, but I can tell you the story. It's just as horrific, no matter what you sort of take my word for it. Uh, I knew someone at one of the big studios who was very close to the president of that big studio. They had a film coming out that we are all very familiar with. If I mention it now, the story will come out. But basically, this particular film, they knew it was coming out, and they weren't sure how it was going to go. It, it could go one way or the other, right? So, you know, you would think that they would be looking inside the studio to say, how can we make it go up? Because we don't want it to go down. We don't want it to lose. But that was not the defining factor of the president of that studio. He actually wanted it to lose money for a very specific reason. He wanted it to lose money so that it would do this to this department where he felt threatened by this executive. In other words, <sighs> and it became one of the biggest drawdowns of that studio that they lost a ton of money because he sabotaged it and he was the president of the studio. On Carter. It's not that. Okay. And keep guessing, but you won't, you might get it, you might not, but I won't say. The point is, I know this from from within that environment, because I knew loads of people, including the, the person who was the head attorney for that particular studio in their environment, I knew them very well. And they were telling me as it was going down, you know, when it looks really bad publicly and everybody's complaining and this film looks really bad and nobody likes it. That's not true. That's literally Sony's play, you know, they're attacking it. So it's crazy, you know? Wow. That, that, yeah. that, that, that is. Well, uh, let's leave on a positive note. What, what, what do you see? What, what do you see coming out of COVID-19 that's going to be really like, where, where are we going to have a, a, a renewal in, in our culture, in our politics, in our daily lives? What, what do you think? And it may not be this year, it may be next year, but where, where is it that you think people can look and say, well, this is what's the good part about this is I saw something the other day where somebody was saying, hey, stop telling me how productive I need to be during COVID. I'm sick of this, right? Like, you know, you're learning French. Well, I don't have to learn French. You know, and I and I thought, well, sure. But to each their own, right? Like I like, I can only do things my way, right? I like every every problem in the world, and you know this from having worked with me, I like problems. I find them to be opportunities, you know. So if we have a problem on set. We're trying to turn that into an opportunity to make the best of it, right? We can't stop all the problems from happening. We can try and find a way to turn them into something. And this is the biggest problem that this country has faced in 80 to 90 years, probably since before the, the, the Second War. You know, the, 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 the issue with um, the rise of Nazism in, in Europe came about because of results of the Great Depression. That was really the root cause of much of it. Mm -hmm. You had the Depression here. You had the Treaty of Versailles that punished Germany in a way. You had all these forces that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler, but there was Benito Mussolini and fascism in Italy. Historically, we can look at it and go, it didn't start in 1940 or even 35. It started kind of in like 1920. Okay. And so we now look at something that is as profound as that, right? Um, it's not really the great, we're not in a depression, we're in a recession, but 20% of the people here in this country are now unemployed suddenly. Crazy, right? From the best best employment numbers that we've had to the worst, and the numbers are not even close. It's, it's worse than anything we've ever seen. So we, it is tempting to look at all of this and to say this is not possible to get past. But what I would say is we have every opportunity to do one thing that is super important in this country. Why are we why are we divided politically? Now you know me, Alec, and I've talked with you off camera about this. I'll say one thing about politics and one thing only, which is I fucking hate politics. I hate politicians because they are a bunch of pikey scammers. It is a self-enrichment scheme. Okay. So once we get past my feelings on politics, it's it's what should we do as people? And the answer would be let's stop listening to be to being told what we we should do and instead let's come together like we did on september the 12th where after september the 11th the day after september 11th we all looked at each other and said we are in this together and so i truly believe that this could be the moment where we are in this together and we begin to realize hey people are the same divided by a common religion right and that religion is politics they are divided by that commonality 
you're either left or right. You're either this big thing, one or the other. And it's like, we are not that. We are all people and we all go around on this planet. Me personally, I would love it if we began to look at solutions and togetherness instead of divisiveness. It's easy to point the finger at someone else and say it's your fault, but it's much better for us to say we are we have a common enemy. So COVID, like Nazi Germany, is actually a bit of a common enemy for us. And I am very hopeful that what's going to happen to all of us is that we'll see that common enemy and we'll begin to say the people who make all the noise and the people that are screaming you know, about politics, we'll stop listening to them and we'll start listening to each other. And one last thing I would say is the problems in America are caused by lobbying. It's illegal in the rest of the world. So what you do as a matter of course here is not what we do in the rest of the world. And if you could get rid of that system, it would be a lot easier. Once we do, we'll come out the other side of this COVID thing and we'll be wiser and we'll be more together. And I know that my door is open to everybody. As frustrating as it is, um, my door is open to anybody to tell me anything because I love the togetherness of, of the world. We can be together. There's, as, as they say about war, there's no left or right. There's only an up or down, right? Um, there's, there's another saying that you know I'm very fond of, right? Because we lead to wars and we're in a war, kind of a culture war right now. War does not determine who is right. It only determines who's left. Right. So it's written by the winner. And and I think that we we need to stop being at war and start being together. And maybe COVID will change that for us. God, I'd like to think so, but boy, all the all the uh everything I see, I mean, all this conspiracy theories and the uh you know the the revolts against staying inside. It just it's uh, I don't know. I think this week for the first time ever, I thought this country is, we're screwed. We're like legitimately, and has nothing to do with COVID and has nothing to do with our economy tanking. I, I just think that people have accepted a level, they are now accepting a level of, uh, of, of things that turn our country into a banana republic. And I'm just, it's scary, and it's 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 scary, and I, I you know I I'd like to think that we're all in it together, and but I don't think unless everyone feels that way, I we, we we're going to keep coming back to the same, yeah. you know, to the same problems. I mean, they, this this uh, our problems are so deep seated, religion and politics and yeah. economics and race and wow, we've got all. So I, I understand the temptation, Alec, to feel like, wow, this is really bad. But I would point out that apartheid ended. And I would point out that the Northern Ireland problem that seemed so intractable and un, was literally brought to an end by uh, basically a bunch of mothers in Northern Ireland who said, we are sick of our children getting killed and killing each other. So they stopped it. We have it in our power as people. And I'm a power to the people guy. I've always been that way. We have it in our power to do it. And so what you and I can work on, uh, as this is what I do. I do it with my, what I create. I do something, uh, you know, I make content and I try to enlighten, educate, but mostly entertain. And once we see our commonality, it won't matter. So I feel entertainment is a big part of my job in this world to, to, to provide entertainment for everybody. I'm an annoying person, right? I love to speak to anybody uh, on the left side of it and on the right side of it. It doesn't bother me. I just see that people have opinions and they're very strong opinions. As a frustrating it is to someone on the right who doesn't like, or someone on the left who doesn't like the right, I'm the guy who, and I'm not in the middle. I'm on the outside, man. I do not go in the middle either. I can't stand politics. So I think that's my thing. I, I think that we will come out of this and we will see our commonality as humans because of our common enemy. And at that point, I hope that we will uh, we will do well. And I hope I'm still alive to see it and I don't get like some horrible disease, you know? That's well, I hope you don't get some horrible disease either. I wish us all health and happiness as Absolutely. as we move forward. And, and, and certainly we are all struggling with the same things right now. So yeah. um, th th that that is positive. But all right, my friend, thank you so much. It's yeah, been man. good seeing you. It's been good having you on. We will... Uh, we will see you once again and uh, keep keep us posted on how things are going. We'll have you back here, you know, in a few weeks um, on one of, and maybe on one of the other shows and uh, keep us posted. And, and, and my regards to your family, say hello to your boy and happy birthday and, uh, and tell Melinda to stay away from that gaming console.
No, no, she's a witch. She's currently the champion. She is a victory royale champion right now, so she don't care. She's walking around the house crowing. So uh, <laughs> I'm currently a champion. I'm not doing it again. So, yeah. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. We'll see everyone tomorrow, 11 o'clock in the morning, for uh, Weekend Brunch with Axanar with Jeff Fagan and myself. Uh, wanna, um, uh, uh, Kelly, I, I see you there, Kelly. Yeah, let's talk for VSFX. Get in touch with me uh, this weekend. I'll be around all weekend long. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today. I'm going to go walk the dogs and uh, tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock. Until then, thank you. Live long and prosper, y'all. Cheers. <laughs>